Dividend Aristocrats Explained is the topic of today's presentation. And if you've wondered what a dividend aristocrat is or how you might go about investing in them, then this is a video that you're going to want to watch. Now, I'm going to start this with a little bit of a story. So back in the day when I was trying to get into finance, I was told by my mentor that I needed to be knocking on doors in London. So on the weekends, I would go down and meet people, anybody that was willing to meet me. I would meet them, and one time I got to sit on a trading desk at Sokgen, and it was a Delta One trading desk, and I thought I was in James Bond's office. It was rather remarkable, and that was back when algorithms weren't doing everything, and the gentleman I was sitting next to was actively trading as I sat there taking notes with my fancy Mont Blanc pen to play the part. I never ended up getting a job on the Delta One desk, but it certainly taught me something. So a Delta One product is a product that gives the investor the same exposure as if you owned the underlying asset. So an example would be an ETF. That's supposed to give you the same exposure as a basket of stocks. But of course, the ETF manager isn't going to go out and buy a basket of stocks that's exactly like the index. They're going to try, it's called a tracking error. But uh, examples of Delta One products other than ETFs are equity swaps, forwards, and futures. Now, in investment banks, I don't know uh, how, how prolific these desks are anymore, but they typically have Delta One trading desks, and they generate most of the revenue from the arbitrage setup of strategies linked to products. So where I learned a lot about these desks was working at MSCI, where I spent a decade there, that's where I ended up being employed, and we were a global provider, a still our global provider of indices, the top global provider. And these desks, and oftentimes the people working on these desks would go and start their own hedge funds. They knew our methodologies better than we did, and the people in our firm who had the uh, best knowledge of our indices were often poached by these individuals. If you want to understand how a financial product works, you need to go to the source and find the methodology document, and that's what we've done. So uh, S&P Dow Jones Indices, they were our competitor. And here you can see a collection of dividend income indices that they've built. An index isn't investable, all right? You need to build a product and attach it to that index. An index is simply a collection of stocks based on a, could be a, other uh, um, asset classes as well, but for the sake of this presentation, let's just consider stocks. Collection, a basket of stocks that has a methodology associated with it. So you can see here that there's a number of, of dividend income uh, indices. The S&P 500 dividend aristocrats, that's what we're going to focus on today. Then you have the second one here, S&P global uh, global dividend aristocrats, high yield dividend, ESG dividend aristocrats, among many others indeed. So S&P 500 dividend aristocrats. Let's start at the top. S&P 500, what is that? Well, it's the top 500 stocks by market cap trading on U.S. stock exchanges. You could say the top biggest uh, 500 stocks in America, that would be the S&P 500. Not to be confused with S&P Global. That's the company that produces this. It's a stock, and they're publicly traded, of course, and also an aristocrat itself. Now, what's an aristocrat? It's simply a company that has increased. I've underlined it because it's that important. It's not paid a dividend for 25 years. It's increased the dividend for 25 years consecutively. And sometimes you'll see firms that have you know, paid a dividend for 50 years, but then when you look at the fine print, it says, well, We've increased our dividend for 30. All right, that's the track record that we look at because you can pay a penny a share and consider that to be a dividend. The amount of the dividend is relevant and that growth over time is extremely important because then you have an, an asset that has characteristics of a bond in terms of the income, except it's not fixed income. It's income that's growing and hopefully outpacing inflation. Very powerful strategy. Some rules. So... The S&P 500 dividend aristocrats, the methodology says that they're capping 
any single sector weight at 30% of the total index weight. So they don't overweight. Although you'll see there's a couple sectors in there that are pretty heavily weighted compared to the rest. GIC stands for Global Industry Classification Standard. That's what we built at MSCI and maintained, I believe, along with the standard in pours. Uh, if fewer than 40 stocks can be found, so if they look at all the stocks in the United States and there's fewer than 40 that increased their dividend for 25 years in a row, then they lower that down to 20. Now, they have what's called quarterly rebalancing. So at MSCI, this was always a busy time when we rebalanced our indices. Uh, that's when the Delta One trading guys always wanted to talk to you. And they also do this annual reconstitution. And at a quarterly uh, rebalancing, they equally weight the companies in the index. There's 66, okay? There's 66 aristocrats. To find the weight, simply take one divided by 66, 1.5%. So they'll move all 66 stocks to a 1.5% weighting. And they can remove companies at quarterly rebalancing if they stop increasing dividends. Now, here's a point of contention and something that we're digging into quite a bit right now ourselves. Regarding spinoffs, so if you have, and let's use J&J, &J, they're having their healthcare spinoff. If J&J &J spins off that healthcare division, are they, because J&J is an aristocrat, are they both aristocrats after the spinoff? Well, it, intuitively, no, because the spinoff should be starting at zero because it has no track record. What S&P says is this. If the spinoff does not indicate it will continue and or initiate a consistent dividend paying policy, it is removed. So if the spinoff says they're going to keep that track record going, and they by all means should, if, uh, if they can essentially shortcut that process, if you will, then that stays in the index and the yearly dividend increase history of the parent company is assigned to both the parent and spun off company. This is a point of contention internally here at Nanalyze as we try to uh, do some work on our quantigence strategy, which we'll talk a little bit uh, about in a second. But there are 66 companies in America that have not only paid but increased a dividend for 25 years or more. Now, we're going to talk about uh, where the red or arrow points, the S&P 500 Dividend Aristocrats Index, but look how many others there are. So I was just going to point out a few here. The monthly that actually rebalances uh, every month, which is uh, rather clever. Emerging markets. Well, how did they, are there actually emerging markets companies that are aristocrats? Well, you need to change the definition a bit. And they move that to five years instead of uh, 25. Uh, it, when it comes to international dividend aristocrats, this is something that a lot of our subscribers have been asking about and we're doing research on at the moment. Unfortunately, S&P has decided that the 25-year rule should change to 10 so that they can populate a list of international companies. We're not overly comfortable with that. 25 years is a solid track record. 10, not so much. And then look here. This one's interesting. The S&P Dividend Monarchs. All right. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. So remember that because a monarch is also called a king. All right, so here's a breakdown of the S&P Dividend Aristocrats Index, the sectors. Remember I talked about how they capped that 30%. Well, look, you've got industrials and consumer staples, very overweighted compared to, at the bottom, energy and information technology. This is a function of the number of companies that are available. And in our strategy, Quantigence, we see this, uh, this same observation that, uh, if you want to pick some good quality companies in this space, then industrials and consumer staples are places where you might uh, need to overweight. Now, when we look at the actual companies in the list, you can go to S&P 500's uh, website or uh, an ETF that tracks this we're going to talk about, and you can download these. So the list is, is freely available. Uh, in order to figure out what the weighting should be, as I said, you take one divided by 66, but here's the current weightings. And why are they so different? Well, that's because uh, market caps change based on stock prices that change. So you can see that uh, since the last rebalance, Pentair, Stanley Black, Sherwin-Williams, uh, Albemarle, that's a, a lithium play, actually, Caterpillar, uh, ADP, these have all uh, moved up. 
whilst if you look on the right, Target, Walgreen Boots, Exxon, no surprise that uh, these companies aren't doing so well, just based on um, what you see in the news. So let's talk a little bit about terminology here because it's important. Dividend aristocrats versus dividend kings. Remember the S&P uh, monarch index? Well, that's they're, those are actually kings. So a dividend king is a company that has not only paid, but increased their dividend for 50 years. So it's twice the track record as an aristocrat. That's a long time to be increasing your dividend. So that's the difference between an aristocrat and a king. Aristocrats versus champions. Okay, this is important. Aristocrats only look in the S&P 500, fair enough, but they're subject to S&P's methodology, which has some rules surrounding liquidity and things like that, where uh, and market cap, where they may filter out some names. Champions don't have any limitations, just 25 years track record and you're in, okay? Uh, dividend aristocrats versus dividend achievers, uh, that's uh, 25 years versus 10. As we said, we just don't find a 10-year track record as compelling as a 25 or, say, 50-year um, track record. Look at this. was taken from DividendGrowthInvestor.com. Over the past 50 years, some calamities experienced include seven recessions since 1967, the Vietnam War, the oil crisis, fall of the Soviet Union, 9-11, dot-com bubble bursting, and, of course, the Rona. These are all events that companies that have increased their dividend for 50 years weathered just fine. There's some serious financial discipline that it takes to do that. You may be wondering, well, what? how many dividend kings are there? Quite a few. So this is taken from The Fool. They put together a list, and you're going to find all kinds of lists out there. They're all different by, you know, one or two stocks, whatever. Uh, but they found 48, and here on the left, you can see the S&P Dividend Monarch. So the question here is, can you invest in dividend aristocrats or dividend kings? Okay, yes, for dividend aristocrats. There's actually an ETF. We're going to talk about that next. But for dividend kings, there's no cur not currently an ETF, but... I'll bet that S&P that puts out this index and somebody launches an ETF on top of it eventually. So the S&P Dividend Monarchs, you can see they registered that trademark there, uh, is the performance of uh, S&P Dividend Aristocrats that have increased uh, for at least 50 years. And I think that um, they have a lower number of firms that can be included in that. But um, there's plenty there uh, to keep them busy, at least according to the fool here. 48 stocks. You can see the names there on the right. I've highlighted two names here uh, in consumer goods. That's going to come up a little bit later when we look at our own methodology. Now, uh, investing in dividend aristocrats. So the way indexing works, as I said before, is these companies create an index and then other firms build financial products on top of those indices. And you need to be very careful about uh, what you choose to invest in. So I've crossed out the one here at the top with the ticker KNG. You need to look at the description very closely. They say here, rules-based buy right index, so that implies they're using options, designed to return approximately 8% over the annual dividend of the S&P 500 index and a secondary goal of generating capital appreciation. Don't get involved in junk like that. I mean, Sure, it's, it probably has some merit to it. There's financial professionals behind it. But you want to go Delta One. You want to stick with investing in the actual companies and not getting involved in additional risks that comes with options. So what you can do here is look at the Pro Shares S&P 500 Dividend Aristocrats ETF. This has somewhere around $12 billion in assets under management. So that's quite high. Uh, the ticker Noble there. Uh, it says here, provides exposure to the returns of the index, so the S&P Dividend Aristocrats Index, without regard to market conditions, trends, or direction. So they try to keep that tracking error as low as possible so you get that pure exposure from that index. Now, when we look at Noble's dividends, right, that's what you're all interested in, um, pretty healthy in terms of the growth here. So you see on the left how it's sort of up and down, up and down. But we smoothed those out on the right, looked at annual dividends for as much history as was made available. 9% compound annual growth over eight years is really good in terms of that uh, dividend payment growing. So that's the beauty of dividend growth investing is that these firms, as I said, they are increasing the dividend every year, hopefully at a pace that... Um, outpaces inflation. And here you can see 9% every year. That's, uh, at least for now, going to do quite well, outpacing inflation. 
So what if we further refined the aristocrats and removed some of the constraints that are in place for institutional investors, such as size, liquidity, free float, sort of expanding our universe, and then we started considering factors where we could start to rank these firms. So factors we might consider include years increased. So there's a big difference between a company that's increased their dividend for 25 years versus 60. That needs to be recognized, all right? Size, size matters in large companies. Um, have uh, easier access to capital. Uh, they thrive better in, in times of turmoil. Uh, international exposure, you don't want to just be exposed to America if something goes wrong there and um, the consumer suddenly uh, goes back into their shells. Yield, you want to have some yield. That's what you're here for. And you have companies like Medtronic that have a 1% yield. Well, they're also growing that dividend a lot. So you need to consider that growth, right? You could look at the growth in two dimensions, five-year compound annual growth rate and 10-year, kind of a short-term, longer-term look. And payout ratio really goes to sustainability. If you take all those factors and rank them and then calculate them out to a Q score, that's what quantigence is. That's a methodology that we developed uh, over the past decade, uh, and it's... Um, something that we're, we're currently refining even more at the moment, but I've put up a sample. Uh, this is a page from our report, and there's actually a lot more companies and consumer staples than what you see here. I just picked the top five. And a couple things to note here. First, um, Procter Gamble there and um, Coke, those are both dividend uh, kings or monarchs. And you can simply take that year's increasing dividend, multiply that by 12, and that'll tell you how many years. And this actually needs to be incremented by one since um, uh, this is last year's report. We're currently updating it. On the right, far right there, you see Q score. I was also going to point to five-year dividend growth. You see the red there for um, Coke, um, is that Archer, Daniels, Midland, and Clorox. Uh, minus one. Well, what happens there is if they're not growing that dividend faster than inflation, they get a penalty, okay? So we say inflation 5%. You need to be growing the dividend, right? If you just grow it by 1% a year, uh, as firms do when they're starting to struggle, 3M, for example, is just doing that 1% a year to keep that track record alive, right? Well, they try to figure out how the hell they're going to fund their dividend with all these lawsuits they're being attacked with. Um, that's uh, something that you need to consider when you know, you're know you looking at growth, right? So 10-year growth may be strong, but on five-year, that starts to say, hey, what's going on here? So something to pay attention to. But this is... Uh, Basically, we have a universe of 74 stocks, and we've calculated Q scores for all of them, and we use that to build our own portfolio of 30 dividend growth stocks. Now, uh, what we're going to be doing soon is taking quantigence from beta to production. So we've built our strategy from the ground up using licensed data. Um, we're refining our universe, as I said. Um, their uh, subscribers have mentioned there were aristocrats we weren't holding that related to the spinoff rule. We're going to replace VF Corporation. We sold that. They stopped increasing their dividend. Uh, we might replace that with a healthcare company. Um, and then we're going to select the top 10 most compelling for the Nanalyze new money portfolio. Now, I certainly didn't want this to turn into a sales pitch, and it's starting to look like that. So uh, I'm simply going to say that um, it's, it's worth a look, and it's a way that you can further refine the list of aristocrats. Now, when, it, when you're thinking about, you know, you can invest in that ETF, right, all 66 stocks, or you can try to refine that list down and build your own portfolio, and that's what we've done, right? Now, how many stocks should you have? Well, you know, 10 there, you can see that's probably the lowest number that you would want to have. And that sort of matches up with the number of uh, gig sectors. I think there's 11. So that's what, roughly one each if you want to diversify that way. But what you'll find is there's a lot of compelling names. Remember, going back to the weighting of industries. So you might want to increase that. And you see here, you know, there's this common rule, oh, 30 stocks is diversified. Well, it doesn't have to be 30. It could be anywhere from 20 to 25. We just happen to choose 30. So just to conclude, you know, this stuff isn't easy to figure out. And what you'll find is that universes of stocks almost always differ, so like Dividend King. So, you know, really looking at a company's track record and making sure that they kept increasing their dividends. Sometimes there's disagreements there, and that's why we turn to firms like S&P 500 to help figure that out. They have research departments that do nothing but work on this stuff. That ProShares ETF, Noble, that's a solid way to get exposure to dividend champions at a reasonable price. 
Now, when it comes to global companies, they're attractive, but we really hesitate to lower that 25-year threshold. But if you think about it, it it kind of still works because if you lower that, you know, you're still reducing the years paid and, and calculating that score differently. Uh, you could max out international exposure factor. And we're going to look at that topic, I think, in a future video, the S&P 500 uh, global aristocrats. Um, Dividend aristocrats, champions, kings, they have a track record of success that isn't easy to achieve, and it's very purposeful. And I recall when Chevron was running into problems with the oil price had dipped uh, to where the uh, people were being paid to take oil, that Chevron, the first slide of their investor deck said dividend. It would, that was dividend, keeping, increasing that dividend was the number one priority of the company. They didn't want to break their track record. So we really believe that uh, dividend growth investing is compelling. It's why the majority of our assets under management here at Nanalyze uh, we're holding in our Quantigence portfolio of 30 stocks. So um, if you're thinking about investing in aristocrats, you certainly couldn't go wrong with Noble. Now, I'm going to put up uh, another video here that you might find of interest on the same topic. Before you watch that, please click the logo on the right. Subscribe to our channel. Thanks so much for taking the time to watch this today.